What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Talk To Me here on NotFest.com. As always, I am Joshua Toomey, joined by the one and only Chris Aiken. Chris, how are we doing? I feel like we just did this. <laughs> we did just do this. Uh, and speaking of that, make sure to check us out on the Slobber Knockers podcast, uh, where we headed over and we did all of our football picks. So that's over on the Cobras and Fire Feed. We did a, a podcast takeover. So go check that out. Yes, sir. Uh, we also podcast this week. Um, Monty Pittman from the Louder Than Life will be released by now. And then you and I both interviewed uh, Wednesday 13. My episode is up on uh, Not Fest, and yours is up on Chris Aiken Presents. And, and right. Wednesday 13, what a good dude. He's the best, man. He's just so, so real, you know, yeah. and unlike so many guys that we have to kind of, especially in his world where they all have like an image, right? You know, like they're portraying an image. I don't really get that vibe off him. I mean, I know he does the whole ghoul thing. Yeah. I think he is just kind of a ghoul. And, <laughs> you, right. You know, I, I don't think it's an image for him. I think it's, you know, and, and it's a lifestyle. More, it is. And more, more in your interview than mine, but he talked all about, you know, his passion for serial killers and for yeah. horror and stuff like that. So he's, you know, he's the real deal and great guy, super nice, always fun to talk to. I'll interview that guy anytime he's doing something. Yeah, he's been on the show multiple times, and uh, yeah, that story of uh, of uh, him hanging out with Alice Cooper and watching a Jeffrey Dahmer documentary on <laughs> Christmas Eve—you know how, how how ghoulish can you get? You know, where, where, where you're sitting down, Alice Cooper, Jeffrey Dahmer uh, 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 documentary, and it's right. on Christmas Eve. Can't doesn't yeah. get any better than that. <laughs> That's the good stuff there. Hell yeah! <laughs> and the new the, his new album that'll be out uh, tomorrow is a uh, horror fire, right? And uh, I I. I've interviewed Wednesday for, I think the last two or three records, three mm -hmm. probably. And this of all of them has to be my favorite. Like I truly, I told him in the interview and I'll say it again, you know, I've gone back to this album to listen to mm -hmm. on, on my own, not just trying to get notes for the interview. Yeah. I, I easily think it's the best, the best that he's done. Even, even murder dolls wise, take everything he's ever done. I think this is the best one he's ever done. It's so solid. So meaty too, heavier, yeah little less punky than some of his other stuff, just a little more meat and potatoes metal, which yeah. I love. Good stuff. Yeah, it's definitely I, my notes, just like riffs, riffs, riffs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where it, where it is on that one, man. So uh, anything else going on in your world before we dive into, this, in, into some news? Not really, dude. Just been interviewing like crazy. I did... Um, 10 interviews in the last seven days. So <laughs> <laughs> I have been, I have been interviewing everybody. So yeah. lots of stuff over there on the Chris Aiken, Chris Aiken.net page for interviews coming up. I think I'm booked up all the way through like mid November or something. Nice. Two a week. So, <laughs> you know, lots and lots of stuff coming. So just, you know, just doing that, which is dude, how can I complain? That's what I do. I do right. interviews and I listen to music all week. It's not the worst work, worst job in the world. Yeah, well, I mean, throw a little bit of love out there to Orianti, man. You interviewed her, and I knew you were kind of you you were kind of uh, skeptical going in, and you came out loving the interview. So tell me I did, it. dude. She was she was really pretty cool. You know, I I didn't know what to expect at all because she is sort of in that whole celebrity realm, right? You know, she's she's you know whether it's being the girlfriend of Richie Sambora or. You know, obviously the Alice Cooper tie-in and, you know, she's she's in that zone where I thought, eh, she might be kind of a stiff, but got to talk to her and she was awesome. She was just joking around and having a good time. And um, she's a monster. I, you know, even before I did this interview, I don't know if you've ever listened to her. She is a no. monster player. Yeah. I mean, obviously she was in Alice Cooper and people just kind of think, okay, her, Anita, Strauss, blah, blah, blah monster player. she's a monster player and when you listen to her music she's she really shows it off that she had put out a dvd last year called live from hollywood where she really just riffs and i mean it's like wow this is this is <laughs> top end stuff and and there's a reason that she was picked for alice cooper and michael jackson and yeah. you know you know she got picked for michael jackson you're not getting that gig i mean she's in the same category as what slash and uh Eddie Van Halen, as far <laughs> right. as people, you know, you're in that category by arguably the biggest artist in the history of music. 
Now, did that did she tour with Michael Jackson or was she just in Michael Jackson at the very end when he he did that she, like live DVD or whatever? She was gonna be on the tour. Yeah, that got canceled when he died. Yeah, but she she in the interview we talked a little bit about that and we talked a little bit about that she played. She played at the memorial at the at the Spectrum or wherever it was, oh, wow. uh, the LA Center. She she ended up playing for Michael Jackson's funeral. So I mean, she was she was in the band. She was definitely she wasn't in it long. She told me she was only in it for a few months, but was interesting to talk to her. And you know, I I asked her about the continuing nonstop coverage of his death. You know, thirteen years later, yeah. and if that annoys her as somebody that knew him. And, you know, she had qu- quite the answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what stuff. we call a tease. <laughs> yeah. So watch it next Wednesday on Chris Aiken Presents. Nice. Well, let's dive into some news here. I've got a few stories pulled up. Not, not a ton going on. And, and some of the stuff we touched on last week. Right. Uh, but we will start because it, it, it definitely escalated since last uh, Thursday that we talked. But uh, quote unquote idiot Sebastian Bach and quote unquote dummy Ronnie Radke exchange insults in a Twitter feud over using uh, the use of backing tracks. <laughs> <laughs> this has been so fun. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ronnie Radke is is quite possibly one of my favorite people on the internet. I know he's probably not the best person in real life, but you know, when it comes to like TikTok and it comes to um his Twitch streams and things like that, he he is just a troll uh to to fight any troll out there. It's it's amazing. Yeah, he's he's definitely he's definitely not letting get this go either. He, you know, he made his point and dummy Sebastian kept fighting back, so he just keeps trashing him and Man, his tweets have been epic. <laughs> I, I I just keep watching them and laughing my ass off. It's so the best one that I saw from him. I don't know if you saw this one or not, but he he typed, you know, because Sebastian kept talking about real rock and roll and real, you know, back in basically doing the old man thing. Back in my day, real right, rock right. and roll was guitar, bass, drums, and singer, you know. And so he posted, he posted, uh, here's Sebastian Bach sending a tweet. And it was a picture of a pigeon with a note tied to its neck. <laughs> I was fucking laughing my ass off, man. Nice. Radke is hilarious, man. Yeah, he's too funny, man. Um, let's see here. Uh, you know, he, he they they come out with the uh laptops being stolen and the uh you know the the cancellation of the show. Um Eddie's initial tweet is uh, this is astonishing. First, I heard about this. I thought it was a joke to wind me up. How much longer are fans, promoters, media just going to accept the epidemic of live rock shows? Not really being live. Paying your hard-earned money to see a band play quote-unquote live, that's truly not live. And there are countless bands in 2022 that hone their craft and play live. Tons, new and old, including one that subbed for them in their slot, jackal no laptop needed there (laughs) this is just unreal but uh, but at least i give them credit for being honest wow i am closer than ever to launching my own band and i can't sing or play a note simply amazing yeah well you know my thoughts on eddie he's a fucking moron (laughs) but um look and, and we've gone through this you know previously everybody of note is using technology now, you know, is he, why? And this is where, if Eddie really wants to get into this, let's get into it. Yeah. Call out your boys and kiss because they obviously use tracks, a lot of tracks. And when they don't, they stink. Yeah. So a lot of life, they needed more tracks. (laughs) Yeah. And so if you're saying that you'd rather see a suck ass version of kiss versus a good show, more power to you, but I think overwhelmingly most people just want to see a good show, have a good time, enjoy, you know, those middle of the road, old kiss songs, right? You know, that's what they want. And, you know, I think you, I think it was you and I that were talking about this on the phone. Where's the call out on Metallica, right? Metallica synchronizes their three quarters of their show is synchronized now, whether it's, 
whether it's the drones flying around on mm -hmm. moth to flame or all of the little cube things that go up right, and right. down and have specific video on it that is synced to it's clearly synced to some sort of a drum intro or something that turn you know that that works it that's done with the computers that's not i i think eddie doesn't get it i i I think Eddie thinks that bands are just getting up there. He thinks they're all Skrillex. Right. And they're just getting up there and <laughs> boom, hit a button. Hitting okay. The there's bar, your yeah. music, you know, and that's not, that's not what they're doing. <clears throat> are they enhancing it? Sure. And most of these bands, I don't care what band you're looking at these days. If they're a big band, they're all using some sort of computer, whether it's, whether it's even using the, you know, the big screens, you know, the big screens that they all use. Now, some of it use it too much. Like you, you were telling me nine inch nails went way overboard at, oh, at yeah. louder than life. And I watched a video of them, uh, from, from here uh, a couple of weeks ago too. And I was like, Jesus, this is hard to watch. I felt like I was going to have a seizure, <laughs> Yeah, you know, but some of them use it a bit too much, but Dude, at the same time, as long as the guys themselves are actually playing their instruments, if there's if there's additional stuff provided to it, who gives a shit? I'd rather see a good show. Yeah, I mean, I've told you a thousand times, as, as long as I'm playing my bass live, and I, and I don't care how many tracks we're playing too, as long as mm -hmm. I'm playing live, then I have no problem with it. The one the one band he brought up here is Jackal, and it's funny, it, like what happens if they get their chainsaws stolen? And I go see Jackal, and they don't have their chainsaws. I'm going to be pissed. Yeah. Like, I need, I need the, I need a chainsaw hacking up a, a a bar stool, or I'm going to be out of there. Well, and and let's just go to the bigger picture. At what point was Jackal ever anything but a mid to, a mid level second tier band? Right. I they were never a headlining band. A headlining band needs to provide a full show. Falling in Reverse provides a full show. Yeah. Metallica provides a full show. Uh, Hailstorm provides a full show, yeah. you know. Kiss provides a full show, of course. They're going to use everything that's available to them, especially the <laughs> with what they're charging for tickets. To, to be perfectly blunt about it, you're charging two, three hundred dollars a ticket. You know, I, I chatted with look, look at me being Eddie Trunk now, throwing in <laughs> Eddie Trunkism. Here. I spoke, to I spoke to Blackie Lawless this week. And he's definitely known to use tracks and whatever. Yeah. And he told me he's doing the biggest show of his entire career. You know, like the stage is like tiered because they're, they're going to try and jam uh, a full stadium per size production into clubs. Oh, wow. And, and so he's going to literally tier this thing and it's going to be all videoed up and whatever. Of course he's going to use tracks. Yeah. And of course, you know, of course he's going to use video syncing and drum drum triggers to sync video and to sync, you know, additional vocals that they can't provide as a four piece, you know, and you know what? Fine. I'm going to go to that show and I'm not going to be disappointed. I would much rather see that than Blackie Lawless and Wasp playing a stripped down shit show that sounds like <laughs> ass yeah. and, and they light the wasp name on fire at the end of the thing, you know, no, I'd rather see the full show. Yeah. I mean, the only time I, I've seen a show where it was like the band, it was the middle of the middle of the, uh, uh bill band. And they did like, you know, stage, right guitar, John, John, John stage, left guitar, John, John, John bass track. And they hit like, they hit a space bar on a bass track and it was like, played a bass line, right. but then there was never a bass player on stage. Now I, that's the, that's when I have a problem. Like when it's a core member of the band and they're like, you know what? We can save, you know, the 50 bucks a day and the $10 a day per diem. If we just play to a bass track, now, yeah. that's one thing. But when it's, if it's, you know, maybe some underlying vocals or uh, a keyboard part that was on the album or, or some kind of enhancement like that, I'm perfectly mm -hmm. fine with it. Yeah, I, I mean, look, Sebastian Bach is the big name that's in this fight right now. Yeah. And what is he? He's a second tier guy, <laughs> you know, honestly. Yeah. And I love Skid Row, so I'm I'm definitely not shitting on it like they're not a good band. I loved Skid Row. And yeah. I like Sebastian's solo records a lot, too. I'll be deadly honest, I do. That being said, if he was playing a big, giant show, 
I would expect him to give me a big giant show's worth of production. Right. And some of that would be involved with a computer. Sorry, but seeing Sebastian Bach run around the stage, swinging his hair and showing off his youth gone wild tattoo, not going to be enough <laughs> for 150 bucks. Right. It's just not. And, and let's be honest. If Sebastian, Sebastian Bach is, is very fortunate with the way that he has always sang that his voice hasn't gone the way of Docking or Rat or, you know, any of these other bands. Yeah. If I've his seen, voice I've, had, what do you think he'd be doing? Tracks. Yeah, but that, of course. Well, I mean, I've seen Sebastian twice, and I loved lived it. I loved it both times. Uh, let's kind of get back to the uh, to the Twitter fight here. Okay. Uh, on October first, Ratke took to his Twitter to respond to Trunk writing at Eddie Trunk. So you want to talk hella shit about laptops, but go watch Kiss lip sync. Steven Tyler plays the piano. Then halfway through the song, he stands on top of the piano while it still plays. Yet here we are acting like they all don't use tracks. You fucking idiot. Literal <laughs> moron. <laughs> he also shared a video of trunk introducing box solo band at a performance. And he included the following message at Eddie trunk introducing at Sebastian Bach using tracks, both idiots talking shit about me using tracks. Can't make this shit up. A short time later, Sebastian Bach fires back, writing, Wow, dummy, are you trying to say that you believe that I use tracks on stage? At Eddie Trunk, how fucking funny is this? Radke then responded, responded, there's a fake audience cheer in your intro tracks, and there's also fake, fake drums, the fuck you mean. <laughs> that shit isn't real. You are using a fake audience cheering as you walk out on a fucking track, hence you using tracks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's right. He's right. Dude, the best, the best thing. I don't know, are you going to keep reading this stuff? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go one more paragraph. All right, go ahead because uh, I, I, I have one I definitely want to highlight. <laughs> things escalated further when Bach tweeted Watch what happens when the track band calls real musicians idiots, prompting Radke to write, The fuck is your bitch ass going to do? You disrespect an entire generation of people after you, that you use synth laptops and backing tracks all while using a fake audience on your tracks as you walk out. Fuck you and fuck Eddie's trunks, bitch ass. Uh, <laughs> Sebastian later added, it's always so much fun to show someone what the real world was like before the internet existed. Get fucking ready. Virtual reality is so much fun until you have to deal with it in actual reality in your face. Can't wait to meet you in person. Name the time and place. And I will introduce you to rock and roll in person, man. Yeah. Sebastian needs to shut up. He'll get his <laughs> old ass beaten. Yeah. You know, he, Ronnie Racky will bite him in his face and just <laughs> murder him. You know, that, that part is just dumb, you know, and it's just Sebastian showing that he's just still a child, you know, he, I'm going to fight you because you don't agree with me, you know, shut up. You know, that part is nonsense, but did you see the post in this thing where Sebastian tried to say, well, you're a bitch. Cause I just played the LA forum. <laughs> did no, you I see didn't. that? He said that, and then somebody pointed out it was the Taylor Hawkins benefit. Right. So Sebastian was trying to take credit for, like, he sold out the L.A. Forum, and it wasn't. It was just that he, he was one of, what, 50 people that showed up at the Hawkins benefit. Well, that was the other, that was the big thing about that Hawkins benefit, because he says, like, from the, from the stage, he's like, you know, let's give it up for the Foo Fighters. Let's give it up for Taylor Hawkins. But most of all, let's give it up for me. Yeah. And, and people were not too happy about that either. As they shouldn't be. What a dick. What what a dumb thing to say at a benefit for somebody that's dead. Yes, the <laughs> only, uh, I, just, I just saw this in, in here. It says, the one person who seemingly defended Ratke and falling in reverse is Motley Crue's Nikki Six. The bassist wrote, keep beating that fake bullshit drum. The sounds so quote unquote, get off my lawn. God forbid if some artists use technology as a creative tool on albums and in live settings. I get it. Just open your mind and stop fighting reality. Makes you sound out of touch. And, and I like that you fly the rock flag. So, 
Wow, that's pretty bad when I have to agree with Nikki Six on anything. <laughs> but I do agree with them. That that is exactly what Sebastian sounds like. An old and and same with Eddie Trunk. Yeah. And the truth is, a big reason that Eddie is doing this is because it's a band he doesn't know. Right. Because there's plenty of bands he does know that he ain't gonna say boo about. <laughs> right. I, you know, I'm positive. I don't know this. I don't know this, but I'm positive that I do that dream theater uses laptops in there and uses technology. And I know they use technology because I know for a fact, Dr Jordan Rudis uses technology. Like he's, he's an inventor of technology. Right. So that being said, why isn't he calling out dream theater reason? Because they're his boys. Yeah. And there's, there's no chance falling in reverse is calling Eddie trunk to have him out to, you know, intro no. a show. You know, he's no. not going to MC. He's going to MC Jackal. He's going to MC fire Yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 And, and that's the point. I mean, Eddie trunk is, he's being the, he's trying to put a sensibility that might work on the monsters of rock crews into today's artists. And no, it's a different animal. They, they build their careers a different way. They, they're not building their careers solely on playing in a club that, you know, that packs in 20 people, you know, the way that the, the bands from the eighties did, you know, they build their, how do they build their audience? YouTube, social media, <laughs> right. You know, whatever. And that, that requires expert knowledge of technology, whether it's making a TikTok video or, making their music video or their music stand out against everything else. Wake up, dude. Time goes on. Time moves forward. God. <laughs> right. And, and it's one of those things where I love Skid Row and I love falling in reverse. So it's like, it's like your parents are fighting right now. Like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to side with falling in reverse, even though I like Skid Row better. Yeah. Because it's just, you know what? It's more, for me, it's more the whole Nothing drives me more crazy, and I'm finding it more and more as I get older, and I'm sure you're starting to see it too because you're a few years behind me. But more and more, the people my age have just stopped appreciating anything new. Right. You know, everybody just settles in on, well, that was my band in 1983, and you know, so I can't talk about anything past Judas Priest. <laughs> and it's like, no, there's so much good music being made today. If you just open your mind and listen to it and it's frustrating as hell on any generation when, when the people of your generation stop growing, you just sound old and tired. You sound like your grandfather did when, when you were playing your music to and your, your grandfather's like, well, we didn't have that in our day. We listened to Perry Como. It's like, oh, <laughs> Jesus, come on. Right. Uh, speaking of the uh, uh, former generation, got a, got a shout out to, to Loretta Lynn, RIP, you know? <laughs> yeah. What did she die of? Do we, is it age? I don't know. Uh, she's 90. Loretta so I mean, yeah, so probably age. It was funny. I actually, cause I love classic country. That's like one of my go-tos sure. in the cars. If, if I'm driving and, and, and I just want to put on something, I'll go back to Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson and all right. that stuff. And, and, uh, so today I was like, I was like bummed out that Loretta Lynn passed away. But then I went to Loretta Lynn Spotify and I was like, you know, I really don't know much Loretta Lynn. And I was, <laughs> I was listening to some of it. I mean, obviously coal miner's daughter, everybody's going right. to know, but, uh, <laughs> there was one song I, there was a few songs that just kept making me laugh, but, uh, the, let me pull it up real quick. As we're talking here, the, the, her number two most played song is a song called come on here in between the, uh, <laughs> Slipknot and heavy metal uh, workout playlist. Uh, let's see here. Um, <laughs> let's see. Don't come home a drinking with loving on your mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's basically you know, don't go out drinking with your boys and coming home trying to get a little piece of ace. So, like who who doesn't do that? I know that's what I was saying. I'm sure Loretta Lynn did that. She probably went out <laughs> drinking. And, <laughs> but uh, but you know, rest in peace, Loretta Lynn. You're, now you're back up there with Conway Twitty. Yeah, there you go, hanging out with Dimebag, fucking Ronnie James Dio, man, yeah. Cliff Burton, and one of those one of those uh, Judds. Is it one of the Judds <laughs> up there? Uh, yeah, the mom Judd. Uh, Mama Judd. Mama Is that Judd. Naomi, Naomi or Wyona? No, Winona. Winona's doing something with uh, Lizzie Hale soon. Actually, I saw that. Uh, 
Oh, I can't uh, have, cannot wait to never pay attention to that. <laughs> yeah, it's like some sort of women who rock thing, which I thought was kind of funny. But uh, mm, good, can't wait to ignore that totally. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I, it seems like we we talk a lot about falling in reverse and laptops on the show, but the one thing we've been talking a lot about is Dave Mustaine on the show. Yes, and uh, and he actually came out and and he says a lot of stuff about Metallica, and you know you're always like, come on, Dave, let's move on type stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is one thing that when it was said, I was like, man, I never really thought about it that way. And I would love this. Uh, Dave Mustaine is still hoping to write new music with James Hetfield. The quote is the world really does want us to do that. I, I, I'm all for this. Like give you me really want to hear that, huh? Yeah. Like it get, see what, <laughs> with what Dave is writing these days and let's see what James, you know, James and Dave have to do together these days. Let's, let's see it, man. Let's see what they got. The question is who's, who's, Who's the band behind it? Right. Do you do you, would you say like Hetfield with Megadeth? Yes, would probably be awesome. Mustaine with Metallica, not would awesome. stink. It would stink <laughs> because because it would it would if it's Mustaine with Metallica, it's going to be middle of the road Metallica because those guys don't write heavy anymore. Right. You know, do you think I, Do you think James has it in him to still be? that heavy do you think james has it in him to be be like uh the sick the dying the dead like sing on that type of music still maybe a song or two i don't think he would do an album right i yeah I, I think look i've said this for a while now i think he wants to retire yeah i think he just wants to be done with all that. i think the only reason he's doing it is because he has too many people that are employed by him and he doesn't want to put them all out of work well, I mean, James is also going through a divorce, him and Tom Brady. So uh, maybe yeah, James, well. maybe James dives more into music now than he, than he would, uh, you know, beforehand, you know, when he had more family obligations. Now, maybe he just dives deep into, into doing music and calls up Dave Mustaine and says, you know what, let's, let's write a record. Well, that I would be okay with that. I look, as long as, as long as this divorce makes him angry again, I don't want to be the guy that says, go back to drinking, but Go back to the drinking attitude, at least, because that Metallica guy is the guy that's missed. I don't care who he's performing with. I miss that guy, the energetic, angry, hey, up there in section 599, get your ass up. <laughs> you know, I miss that guy. And that guy has been replaced with the, hey, friends, we got some nine-year-olds in the second row here. Welcome to the Metallica family. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime he says the Talica family, I just want to fucking vomit. Be mean, be angry, be Metallica for God's sakes. Um, back in 2012, Mustaine apologized to Hetfield for publicly discussing the fact that Dave wanted to assemble a quote unquote super group combining Mustaine and the then Megadeth bassist Dave Ellison with Hetfield and Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich. <laughs> yeah, see, that would suck. That would suck because Lars would run it. Yeah, Lars, I think would 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 bring that down. But man, you give me you give me Hetfield, Ellison, and Mustaine, and give you're not me gonna uh, get that though. You're not gonna get that though. Yeah, you're gonna get Mustaine. We got to figure out who are their common friends. So you're gonna get Mustaine, probably like Charlie Benanti, <laughs> right? And um, a bass player probably somebody from like coc or something yeah i mean or just rob trujillo <laughs> yeah or, or it could be trujillo too i mean trujillo's everybody likes him so you're right you know i don't know i don't i don't see how that could work personally i i, I mean i'm I, it's a weird one because i love both bands so much but i almost think that it's just a formula for failure it would have to be so amazing or it would be a letdown. If it was just good, it would be a letdown. Right. You know, and that, that's kind of scary to me. I'd rather them just keep hating on each other. I like that better. Yeah. And that quote was told to the vinyl writer music. Ooh. <laughs> I follow all their things. Uh, secretly hoping that there would be a day he could write music again with James Hetfield. I well, mean, I would be for it, man. I would, I would, I would be a first day uh, Spotify listener of that one. What would you rather get? <laughs> an EP from them okay. or a true solo record from Hetfield? Ooh, 
That's a good question. Um, I think if James did a true solo record, I think it would be very acoustic guitar based and very outlaw country. Mm -hmm. Um, not saying that that would be a bad thing. Obviously we just went through my love of Johnny cash and, and old country. So I think I would, I would, Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah. If you're going to give me like the Hetfield Mustaine band or, or a full album of Hetfield solo. Whew. See, I think the scary part, I think Dave would try to write commercial with Hetfield and like, he might, yeah. try to get that like inner Sandman money, you know, yeah. and, and instead of doing, you know, jump in the fire part two. I think they, I think he would try to do a nothing else matters or something. Yeah, maybe he would it. try to do a outlaw country music record. Yeah. I mean, Mustaine is not, has not been very good when he's ventured away from Megadeth too. Right. For whatever. I mean, that, that MD 45 was just total shit with leaving. <laughs> Ooh, uh, that, that was garbage. Actually, when, when Loretta Lynn passed away today, I was talking to my wife and, I somehow got that uh, that Nancy Sinatra these boots mm-hmm. song stuck in my head, and I was really thinking back to like when Megadeth covered that on the first album, right? Just like why would I mean I know it's forty years ago, so it doesn't really matter at this point. But what got into Dave Mustaine's brain that he thought he should cover these boots are made for walking, <laughs> and, and just those? I mean, I just there's a couple of lines in that song I was like laughing about today. I was just like. Cause like right before the solo, he's like, are you ready boots? <laughs> you know, and he's like, start walking. And then he starts the solo. Right. And then, you know, towards the end of the song, he's like, one of these dudes, one of these days, these boots are going to stomp all over you. And I'm like, <laughs> I, was, and I didn't even listen to it again today. And I was just like, man, how cheesy of a cover. Yeah, is this song? It's not real good. <laughs> <laughs> are you ready boots? <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's how you start on a guitar solo. That would be a good one to ask him eventually, but it's not like any of us are going to ever speak to the mighty Dave Mustaine. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's like, I mean, that's, that's something maybe you throw in the, for the 30th time that we interview Dave Ellison for whatever project he's doing, which yeah. I, did you see that his band, uh, was it Deeth got signed to Napalm records? I thought that was pretty awesome. I did. And he'll yeah. be doing the circuit pretty soon. I've got that other record that he did the Ellison, um, Soto record. Oh, nice. How was it? It's good. I mean, it sounds like, David Ellison with Jeff Scott Soto singing, you know, it's pretty <laughs> much what you'd expect, but he'll be, he'll be doing that, that scene. We'll have to remember to ask him about the, the, what in the hell they were thinking about with boots. He'll probably just say <laughs> heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready boots? Yeah, that's too good. Uh, I, I, you know, this is, I pulled this one up because this is the band we never talk about. This is a band. I don't think I've in the seven years of the show. I don't think I've ever talked about interviewed and whatnot. So, um, what are your thoughts on Godsmack? You know what? I don't hate them like everybody else does. I, I, I'm a fan musically of them. Yeah, but they suck live. Oh my god, are they boring? I mean, they, they sound good. I'll give yeah. them that. They, they, they sound really, really good live. Yeah, but they are the kings of stand still. <laughs> they all just stand nice. still, and e- even Sully. Sully may walk around a little bit, but it's just kind of slow moving. It's boring. Yeah. I, I've seen them a bunch of times and they really are boring, but I like their music. They're, you know, they're, they're okay for radio rock. Yeah. These are heavy. Yeah. They, they are probably, but they're up there with, I would rather listen to Nickelback. I think than Godsmack. Wow. Um, and, and, and so this, this headline is uh Sully Erna on the upcoming Godsmack album, lightning up the lighting up the sky. This is the last record we're ever going to do. I'll say thank you, guys, man. <laughs> <Too many celebrates. laughs> I wish you had done this about 20 years ago, but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> you know what? I have a special place in my heart for Godsmack, though. They played before they were famous, before the first record was even popular. Yeah. They played a little club here in Cleveland, Peabody's Down Under, and it was a little club. This was there was actually a second iteration of Peabody. So it was much bigger. This is the original that was half a step above a closet. Right. I mean, it, it was tiny and they played there one night and I was there covering it for a magazine that I used to write for. And there was me, there was about four people <laughs> and there was the bar staff. Nice. I mean, nobody was in this room and they played for an hour 
like they were playing in front of a studio. Still boring, still boring as <laughs> shit on stage, but right. they they brought it. They played they played an hour and they sounded great. And it was a it was a really good time. And it was I just remember when they started blowing up. I was like, how can this band that I saw in front of like three people be huge now? But good on them. They they've made their money. So oh yeah, they're they're probably wealthy. I'm imagining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can take their money and hang out in uh, Boston and do all do their things. It opens the door for uh, Shannon Larkin to go back to Ugly Kid Joe. Yeah, <laughs> get him, get him back there. I think Shannon Larkin played on that Vanilla Ice Metal record too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. He's a good uh, player. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, this one I read this the other day. I thought it was pretty pretty funny. All right. Uh. Heading over to Loudwire, there's a study that suggests that straight male extreme metal guitarists are trying to impress other straight men. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, the quite in the, the, this is a tweet from a uh, thing called Quite Interesting. Uh, research, research shows that heterosexual men who learn to play extreme metal guitar are mostly motivated to do so in order to impress other heterosexual men. Where was this poll taken? Grinder. <laughs> um, let's see here. The study itself is called Extreme Metal Guitar Skill, a case of male male status seeking mate attraction or byproduct centers around the theory that artistic expression can be explained in a couple of a uh, couple of ways. So, uh, sexual selection or byproduct of the complexity of the human brain. Uh, translation, humans make art mainly to get laid for other reasons. Um, basically, it just it, the that that the that was a, a way deeper way for extreme metal guitar players. They don't play extreme metal guitar to get laid. They play extreme metal guitar to impress other extreme metal guitar players. <laughs> I don't know about all that. I mean, I'd certainly agree with the part that they don't play to get laid because there's no girls at those shows, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Do you, um, I mean, I, what's considered an extreme metal guitar player. Is that machine head? Is that uh cannibal corpse? I mean, where, where's the line between extreme and not extreme? Um, I, I, th I was taking it more as, as like a, like a, uh, extreme metal guitar skill, like anybody that shreds and like that only other musicians can even comprehend what they're doing. You know, you're up there and like a, like a, like, like an a, Ingve? Ing well, Ingve or even like a, like a, like a Tosin from animals as leaders, stuff like that. Like that's just like, like blowing your mind. Right. Stuff. Okay. I think that, uh, any of that stuff. I think that that's way more, uh, the people learn that way more to impress other guitar players rather than they're not trying, they're not trying to do that because they want to be CC DeVille. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. That's an interesting <laughs> concept way to look at. I don't know about all that. I, I think everybody that plays an instrument is looking to get laid on some level. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought that Care was to comment? I, I thought you would uh, <laughs> you know it's funny and in, in, in all honesty, when I first started playing as a kid, I played yeah. because I for a love of the music. And I didn't really think about girls until like not think about it like I I was never like the the go out and get laid guy until much later in life. <laughs> so you played your first show. <laughs> <laughs> But on that note, um, yeah. uh, at Louder Than Life 2022, Indian folk metal band Bloody Wood played their first ever show in America. After absolutely crushing the stage, the guy sat down for an interview to talk about their music, touring the United States, and to where to get the best pancakes. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, this is over at Loudwire, too. I, I need to actually watch this interview. I will I will take time to, to check it out. Um but I, I am glad that people are taking notice and that, uh, you know, that basically the headline here was uh, bloody Wood have read your comments and they can't thank you enough. I think bloody Wood is one of those bands, man, that people are, are universally just taking to and, and uh, really rooting for. And everything I've seen from this tour, they've been posting photos of the tour. 
sold out shows everywhere close to sold out shows you know in, in other places and uh even even they posted the other day like people just don't come to america and sell out like the gramercy like, they, you think this is this yeah. is a, a nice little metal phenomenon here well it, it, yes and no i mean it's 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 nice that it, it 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 is unusual that it's happening but let's be honest they're really fucking good oh yeah yeah that helps a whole lot if they if they sucked it wouldn't be happening you know that that's the first thing and the other thing is is that they're really personable yeah you know you you met them you met them in person as well as doing the interview and you know how were they they seemed like they were like really cool right yeah i mean raul i interviewed him he seemed to be very when i interviewed him you know on the on the internet uh you know, he seemed to be very excited that that someone from Knotfest was talking to him. And then sure. when I saw him in person, he was like, dude, you said you were going to be here and you were here. Like, he, you know, he remembered me from the interview sure. and just smile on his face the whole time. And just it, it, the show that they put on at Louder Than Life, if they just build on that, they're going to be massive in a, in a few years. You know, I don't I don't know if they'll make it to like like Rammstein type levels, you know, kind of the a foreign band making it that big. Sure. I don't, I don't know their, I don't know the bloody wood ceiling, but I think that they could be definitely doing, you know, huge, huge numbers in the States. Um, you know, if they continue on this, on this path. Sure. Well, they are damn good. I know that. I don't know. I don't know where they're going to get to, but I know I like them. I, yeah. I really dig their tunes. So that's, that's all you can really hope for though, really is that the people enjoy it enough to listen to the next one. So, and as far as Ram Ramstein or Ramstein goes, I mean, dude, who 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 could ever have predicted that? <laughs> right. I, I mean, they sell out stadiums, and ninety nine percent of the people that are at those stadium shows can't name three songs. They yeah. are an anomaly to themselves. Yeah, that's. I, I was reading something the other day. I th it takes like two or three days to put that stage together yeah. in each in each city they go to. I don't know if they have like an A B and a crew B going at the same time, like kind of you know, uh, uh, leapfrogging each other to get to the next stage. But I mean, it, I think that they are just one of those bands. I mean, they have, I got into some of the early records. I saw them open for, uh, on, on the family values tour with yeah. corn and ice cube and Biscuit, and, and I was blown away. Like I, I saw it twice on that tour and loved it both times. Mm -hmm. And then I know that they did like a club tour with like soul fly after that. And they, but then they, they kind of almost kind of like went back to Germany and then came back just, selling out some of the biggest stadiums in the States yeah. off of, off of, I think just reputation. And like, people are like, dude, you got to see the show because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know that people are buying Rammstein records at a, at mm -hmm. a crazy pace and, you know, radio hits and things like that. I mean, we've got the Sirius XM and they've got the, the one channel. Um, uh, I can't even think of what the channel is called, but it's like the nineties and early two thousands rock. And it, you know, they play do host all the time, but it's not yeah. like, it's not like they're they're playing tons of other stuff. Yeah, I can't even name another one. I know that <laughs> song. I, I think that's the only song anybody knows is "Do Haas. Right. Yeah, or yeah, the, the first couple of albums probably have a couple of songs on it that I got into. But yeah, you you just don't. I I, I don't understand that band. <laughs> like I don't they understand got how they've gotten huge. <laughs> but the only thing I, I saw that same tour you did, and they were they stole the show. The, yeah, the, the Cleveland show they stole. They absolutely were better than. Corn, Limp Biscuit, Ice Cube, all of it. They were they were the best. And I didn't know it. I honestly was thinking, okay, this is beer line and merch table time. And I stuck around for like one or two songs. Next thing I knew, I stood for the whole thing because I was like, damn, <laughs> these guys are fucking great. So, yeah, that that was a crazy lineup too, because they went on right before corn. Mm -hmm. And um and that was, you know, the, I, I think maybe Do Host was maybe getting a little bit of love at the time, but when we we drove we went and saw that show in St. Louis and we saw it in Kansas City and I think we went to Kansas City first and we got there like super late and we got there right as Rammstein was going on stage and at that time you just you didn't see things like that on stage you know the, right. the dildo and basically coming all over the first few rows of the crowd right. and and just everything going on on stage man just just was just like holy shit well like even even to, on that show at least the show the show we i got i'm sure you got the same thing yeah he did like a whole song on fire oh yeah you know yeah, yeah. a lot of times you see these guys they might light something up for like a minute yeah. and or 30 seconds or whatever and put it out he did like a five minute song walking around the stage with his coat on fire 
I was like, damn, this is fucking amazing. You know, I was like, wow, this is a stage show. Yeah, and I'd be okay with them using tracks. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure they they use some sort of enhancement because they've got the keyboard guy doing going, doing God knows what. So yeah, you of know. course. Yeah, let's let's do some tracks. Uh, last story before we get into some uh, to some to some recommendations and some other okay. stuff. Um, the 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 Rage Against the Machine uh, North America tour for 2023 uh, they canceled because of Zach De La Roca's uh, torn Achilles tendon injury. Yeah. Um, and people, and the one thing I've, I've, I've seen a lot of are people mad about this. I'm like, you know, from what I saw from the early, from the first show, you know, when he was jumping around being Zach, it mm-hmm. looked awesome. And yep. I'm not the biggest rage fan. I would love to see them live. I think I would, it's, I think it would be one of those bands where 99% of the set is probably just hit after hit after hit. Sure. And, and, and you're almost like, oh yeah, that's them too. Oh yeah. That's them too. Kind of thing. Um, but, uh, I I saw the shows online after the injury where he's like sitting on a road case and I'm sure it sounded fine. But I mean, when I see, when I want to see, see rage, I want to see Zach being Zach mm-hmm. and jumping and, you know, going crazy on stage. And if he can't truly perform right, I don't want to see that. I've had this argument on the CMS before, and I'll stand with you on this one. If you have to sit in a chair to play your set, don't <laughs> yeah. show up. Don't yeah. bother. It, that's not what I paid to see. I didn't like it when Axl Rose did it. I didn't like it when um, Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl did it. I'm not going to like it with Rage Against the Machine doing it. I'm not going to like it with anybody doing it. You know, no. If Steve Grimmett could get up there with one leg before he died <laughs> and play shows, yeah. either play your show or cancel the gig, period. Now, I, I don't see why people are upset. You know, they're going to reschedule. You know, yeah. as much as they claim to be anti, anti government, they're certainly up for the um up for pro co- um capitalism. They like to make <laughs> right. their money, so they're gonna they're gonna reschedule the gigs. So just wait till he heals; he'll be back in six months, and then you can see the shows. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's one of those things where you know, Rage is one of those bands that that's that's few and far between with their live shows. So so doing a big, I think, what is it like thirty date? Uh, you know, North American tour, you're going to be bummed that that gets, that gets canceled because you also, I guess, run the risk of them not doing anything ever again, you know, yeah. because, because Zach's one of those dudes that, you know, no social media, no, you know, no real desire, I think to be, uh, on stage or, or out in front of people like, like, uh, uh, what's the guitarist name off the top of your head? Um, Tom Morello, Tom Morello. Yeah. You know, he's, doing radio shows, radio takeovers on Sirius XM and he's doing stuff with other bands. And I mean, the whole band had another band with, with audio slave and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they, they've kind of continued on to where Zach is like this kind of aloof. And so I, I wonder if it's tough to get him to, um, you know, uh, commit to doing tours like this. Like, you know, yeah. I can see, you know, one-off shows, Coachella type shows, but a full on tour, I think I wonder I wonder how tough it is to even get him to say yes to that. Well, apparently money talks. So <laughs> right. You know, if he was willing to do it before, he'd be willing to do it again. He'll wait till his shit heals and then he'll get right back to it. You know, it, it, dude, they're not gonna leave. I mean, this is a big tour. It's huge yeah. money. Zach's probably gonna make enough fuck you money for the rest of his life off these 30 dates. He's gonna do them. And he probably likes the songs too. I mean, he wrote them for God's sakes. He's probably got a connection to them. Oh yeah. So why wouldn't he do them? Well, I will say it's noted here that tickets bought through online Ticketmaster or Access will be automatically refunded to the original method of payment. Uh, so it's it's not like they're they're saying that these will be rescheduled and holding mm-hmm. money like like a lot of tours did. Have I told you that story about the where where uh, you know Melissa bought Deftones tickets? Um, it was a couple of tours ago. That got the tour got canceled, but from the time that she bought the tickets to the time where they were canceled, she had canceled that credit card that she had bought them with. Okay, and so and so so Ticketmaster was saying that the money was refunded to the to the credit card. The credit card company was saying that they never got anything. So like that's like two hundred and fifty bucks just like out there somewhere Ugh. in the ether that like nobody will take a uh, uh, you know ownership on. <laughs> I just. I think that's crazy. That sucks. So she's just not getting her money. 
yeah, I mean, we've tried many different ways to 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 go at these people, and yeah, Ticketmaster is saying that they've refunded the money. The credit card company is saying that they never got anything. There was nothing. There was nothing for the money to be re- refunded to. So okay. it's, it's kind of just out there, just hanging out. Yeah, that's what you get when you pick boring bands. <sighs> Goddamn, <Chris. laughs> uh, happy anniversary, twenty seventh anniversary to uh, uh, Deftones Adrenaline. <clears throat> yeah can you believe that album is 27 years old that's great yeah i can we're old i hate to say <laughs> it, we're old yeah <laughs> that was like a high school record for me but um yeah so other than that man uh, do you have any good recommendations for the week um i have been listening to a band called elaine e-l-e-i-n-e okay and they have an acoustic record called acoustic in hell and i'm going to describe it and you're going to think it sounds terrible but it's really good even though it sounds (laughs) terrible it's it's a it's a it's a, a symphonic metal band allegedly that has kind of the lacuna coil thing going like okay. a, a, a smooth voice and then a growler guy. And they took that sound, took away the metal and stripped it down to an acoustic thing. And that sounds like it would be awful. And it is awesome. It is so good. It's called acoustic in hell. Okay. And it's, it's surprisingly good. I, I went into it thinking this is going to suck. And I listened to it and I was like, eh, let me play this one more time. Let me play this one more time. Let me, and I've listened to it now like 25 times because it's, it's just really strong stuff. So musically I would go with that and, um, TV. I don't know. There's really not much. A lot of shows have started up, but none of them are any good right now. Um, the only thing I'm watching, I know this is, this has been out a few months, but I'm just now catching it. Uh, the, the latest season of American horror story. Okay. Is is actually pretty pretty intense so far. You know, I'm, I'm I'm all of 3 episodes into it, so it's you know, it's it's 10 episodes deep, but but it's Macaulay Culkin is just a weird <laughs> creep in this thing. I mean, he's he's very weird and very creepy and um it has you know, it, it, it I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but it deals with sort of zombie, sort of vampire sort of you know kids being put in the wrong position between the zombies and the vampires it's real fucked up which if it's that then I, you know i'm into it so american horror story for the for the tv thing and elaine for the music thing <laughs> all right yeah as we were getting ready i couldn't think of anything that i've been listening to or watched i know we were talking about that that marilyn monroe movie Blonde. Is it blonde or blondie or whatever yeah. that that my wife was watching it, so I was watching it, and and that was one of the more fucked up things I've seen in a long time. Right, um, just just and that was in the first you know twenty minutes of the movie. I didn't even get to finish the entire movie because I was doing other stuff. But but yeah, as for just a dark movie, from what I can see from that movie, just Jesus Christ, man, what that that yeah. just that just came out of left field. If the first 20 minutes of that movie are true, it's not at all a wonder why Marilyn Monroe was completely fucked up for her most of her life. Right. Because wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did go see Bill Burr. Uh, okay. I did, go, I did go see him at the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the arena here. Um, you know, it was funny listening to people talk as we were going into the, to the, uh, the, the, the arena. They, they had the top, kind of blacked out so i would say i'm gonna say thirteen thousand people maybe you okay. know 10 to thirteen thousand. and even up to the time the show started i was a little worried because i mean it was very you know spotty when it came okay. to, to the crowd but when he uh, uh when he finally came on i mean the place was packed right um and it was weird they took the you know they, it was one of those things where they they you put your phone in a pouch Mm-hmm. That, that you know you can't get into but you keep the pouch or whatever and and uh it's it's funny how much people how how much we kind of just depend on our phones for so much stuff oh yeah like people that had watches 
that knew what time it was were like they were like gods at that point because nobody <laughs> knew what time it was. Right. And and they were also like the, I think the show doors were at seven. The show was supposed to start at eight, and it was like eight thirty, and it had, still hadn't started yet. But we didn't even know it was past eight. Like I still right. thought it was like seven forty five. Right. And then someone was like, I heard someone ask someone else what time it was. Like, oh, it's eight twenty. I was like, wow, okay. Um. And we we had actually we we were walking around and I stopped at a uh, one of the concession stands. They're like, "What can we get you?" And I was like, "I just need to know what time it is." And they're like, "Oh, it's you know seven thirty. And I was like, "I was like, how do people live like this? Like, what <laughs> what what did we do before everybody just had a phone and a you know a, a, a device in their pocket that they yeah. could Google anything at any time and yeah. see what everybody was eating for dinner at any time? It's crazy." <laughs> Well, people. you know, everybody had a watch. Yeah, that was the way it was. Everybody had a watch, or or, or everybody like remember. I don't know if you if you're even old enough to remember this, but everybody <laughs> had the internal clock too. Yeah, like you know, when I was a kid, my mom used to always say, "You need to be home by like nine o'clock or whatever time." You know, in the summer, and I never wore a watch. I just knew when it was nine o'clock, and I always got home. <laughs> You know, right about nine o'clock, it'd be like eight fifty-five or whatever. But you just yeah. sort of knew that day is done. You know, I know I wake up in the morning, and I, I don't know if it's fucking six in the morning or ten thirty. I have no idea. <laughs> you know? um, no, I could normally wake up in the morning and know if I'm. I can always tell. I'm like, ah, I just woke up ten minutes before my alarm is going off, and right. you look, and it's you know ten minutes or whatever. But uh, uh, but Bill Burr, man, I there's not a lot of jokes that I go away from. Like there wasn't anything I could tell the next day at the water cooler type stuff, mm -hmm. but we were laughing our ass off from like the moment he walked on stage to the moment he left. That's cool. And you know, he was, you know, he's kind of got this Southern redneck voice that he was making, he was making fun of Kentucky the whole time he was there and, and just, just kind of just falling into that, that redneck voice that just cracks me up. My wife was laughing her ass off. The funny thing was, is in, people that know his humor should know this, but you know, if he makes fun of liberals, he's going to turn right around and make fun of um, right. conservatives. conservatives. Right. But, but the, the people there was, there were two people in our aisle and this, this one guy sat down next to my wife mm -hmm. and, and did something I've never seen before in my life. He, you know, the cup holders that are in front of every, you know, on the seat on the back of the seats or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Her her empty beer can was in in the thing. Okay. He didn't ask or anything with the cup holder. He picked up her beer, shook it, saw that it was empty, put put it on the ground, and then put his water bottle in this in the cup holder. <laughs> and I'm just like, what the fuck was that? You know? Right. Like, and she was like, and I told her about it later. She's like, I didn't see that part of it. I just know that he like. He he did the, you know took over like the the cup holder or whatever because the, <laughs> and, and even I was like I was even doing the cup holder math and I was like going down uh, and like technically that would have been her couple I mean I was I was livid on the inside right but uh, so so this this goes on and then Bill gets into this um, you know he's talking about the new clan outfit and it's not white sheets and stuff like that anymore it's. American flags on the back of pickup trucks and having right. the constitution on one arm on your, on one tattoo on your arm and declaration of independence on the other arm and blah, 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 like just totally making fun of like that hardcore American guy, Sure, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming what this, this guy was is like hardcore American guy. <laughs> right. Cause, Cause like right about that time, man, him and his wife got up and they just huffed and puffed out of there. And I was watching around the state and around the arena, man, he was walking a lot of those people because he was, he was definitely making fun of the Trump, but he, but at the same time he made fun of, he would, he would do that thing where he would make fun of Biden mm -hmm. and all the Trump people were like, woo. And then he would make fun of Trump and they'd be like, Burr, you know, like you know, they get all mad. And, and he was, he was kind of making fun of, he had some abortion jokes in there and he had some Biden and some Trump jokes in there. And, right. and man, he was just, he was walking the crowd. It was, it was, I was like, how do you people not know? Yeah. Bill Burr's comedy. Like, why are you people here? Yeah. How do you get mad at a comedy show? Yeah. How do you find the comedy to be too whatever that you're actually going to leave it after you paid to go there? I mean, how much were the Bill Burr tickets? I'm sure they weren't cheap. Uh, 50, about 50 a piece. All right. So dude and his chick, hundred bucks, 50 more to park. Yeah. Probably another 50 to eat something. 
you know, so you're too aching math here, 200, 250 <laughs> deep. They're like a thousand dollars deep. Yeah, at this point. You're, you're like ten thousand dollars in the hole for this show, <laughs> yeah. you know. No, you know, you you know, you're you're a few hundred dollars deep, and then you're going to be offended. Yeah. Why did you even go out? Stay and home and watch his Netflix special. And I think Bill Burr is one of those one of those people that I mean, outside of his comedy specials, and and maybe F is for family. Like he's not movie star. Like people weren't there because of the King of Staten Island. You know, they weren't there because they saw him on Breaking Bad. Like I they, they were in the Mandalorian, man. Yeah, like there, there weren't <laughs> all these Star Wars fans there because because he was in the Mandalorian. Like you're there because he's a great comic. Sure. And you, you know, you you've watched all of his specials over the years, and you you've gotten into him that way. He he, it's not like he was, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, where you love Seinfeld, so you go. Right. You know, even though obviously Jerry's a great comic, but I'm saying, you know, you're you're not going to see him. Ray yeah. Romano, because you love everybody else, Raymond, you know, right? Sure, but yeah, he he was he was great, man. And, um, like I said, I've I've tried many different ways to, to, to find an email on him or reach out to a publicist on him because I would love to get him on the show just to talk. And we don't even have to talk comedy, I just I love when when he's he's on his podcast talking about Pantera or Meshuga or Tool or you know, he's, sure. he's he's a big metal guy, so we got to send that out into the world, man, Bill Burr. Come on the Talk To Me podcast. Well, I might know a guy. Uh, you might know a guy. Does that guy know that guy? I th- I'm pretty sure that they do know each other. Well, there you go. Well, maybe maybe your guy knows a guy. Yeah. Well, we'll find <laughs> out, won't we? Right, right. And if not, you can shut down his website. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no more gigs for you. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> But yeah, other than that, man, not not a whole lot going on. Actually, this is like the between getting all of the interviews together from Louder Than Life and and just the normal interviews that I normally put out, and doing this and the the football show and and Louder Than Life itself and doing a concert, man, it, it's like just now kind of getting to the point where I can breathe again. So there you go. Haven't really had time to do much. Let's go. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I think. Well, I can't. I was about to say I was going to sleep in on Thursday, but that's not happening either. Nope. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, I think that will do it unless you've got anything else for uh, for this week. Nope. All good, man. All right. Well, so for the uh, Talk To Me podcast, I'm Joshua Toomey. I am Chris Hagan. And we will talk to you soon. See ya.